everybody to another edition of the In the Paint Show presented by Ball is Life, episode 141. As we chug along here, as we transition from the summer to the fall, basketball is uh, getting started all over the country. Obviously, Chelsea, you are in the middle of a basketball tournament last season. Um, honey, how are you doing? Good, man. Just uh, fall leagues, a lot of scholastic yeah. stuff, practices, college coaches. There is the first day was September 9th. So just tracking where they're going, what they're looking sure. at. Busy time. How about you? Yeah. No, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, getting ready for the season. Like you said, fall leagues. Uh, went to a fall league this past weekend. Obviously, coaches are out. Coaches were able to out. Coaches can watch prep teams, but can't watch high school teams, which makes no sense at an event. Right. You know, but they can go to the practices, which are which are good. So a lot of teams are, are gearing up for that. Uh, the weather's been crazy. LA's been crazy in general. But, yeah, like uh, a week ago, it was Vegas weather, Chelsea. It was like 110 out here, 19, and like people can't handle it at all. They're like, this is crazy. <laughs> There's like – bunch of neighbors getting their acs you know installed i'm like oh you guys are getting taxed like you know you never get the ac in the middle of the summer when it's hot like you just get it in the fall you know what i mean so that's <laughs> been going on there's been a lot of crazy things been going on but chelsea wanted to ask you about your season what what is it like and and give people a clue like we're here in the in the WNBA plus the WN finals are here connecticut versus las vegas what level of play are you playing at compared to what level you're seeing, like, in the W? You know, what? how does that compare? How does a pro compare? Okay, um, well, I'm playing in the Arab Championship. Um, okay. This year, the country, the host country is Tunisia, um, and that's wow. the team that I'm playing for. So we talked a little bit about it on the last pod. Sure. Um, Tunisia is a country that's located in northern Africa, um, but because it has a heavy Arab presence, it's considered um, in this Arab Championship, which is predominantly uh, Middle Eastern countries. Um, but there is a lot of former WNBA players, uh, people that have touched the league at some point. Uh, my teammate in particular is Shavante Zellis, um, 13, 14 year uh, WNBA vet, uh, won a championship with the Indiana Fever uh, just last season was playing with the uh, uh, Washington Mystics. So this is the, actually the first year that she's been out. Sure. Um, and, you know, we've talked about it a little bit before about why players aren't able to, you know, maintain these spots, whether it's just the roster or the money. Um, but she's totally a WNBA uh, caliber player. And she's been so for a long time, even though she's kind of uh, towards the end of her career at age uh, 36. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of players like that. Uh, Elizabeth Williams, who is the starting center uh, for the Washington Mystics, she's playing for um, a Lebanese team. She's playing for Lebanon. Um, so she's out here. So there, there's definitely a WNBA presence. Um, I think just in general, when when you're playing in these leagues, um, you know, across the world, um, it's not going to be in comparison to the WNBA because the WNBA is a uh, collection of the best talent we have just gotcha. period. So in any of these leagues, you're going to see um, a presence, but you're going to just see a couple of players sprinkled in here or there. Um, you gotcha. see a real dominant presence in leagues like Russia, which will not have a WNBA presence uh, this year at all. Um, but for the most part, um, I would say the level is still, I, I wouldn't consider it super high level, but uh, definitely professional and definitely competitive and a step up from, you know, what you would see like in college or, uh, or, or something like that. So. Makes sense. Now is the league you play in, in Israel, in your opinion, a step up from this, or is it like that's similar? And then the, there's the WNBA. Uh, well, Israel is probably considered a top 10 international league, gotcha. um, especially on the men's side as well. So obviously Russia, China, Turkey uh, pretty much reign supreme in terms of uh, just caliber um, of play because they have, you know, really strong local players. They're paying a lot of money and they're getting the premier WNBA players like all star caliber uh, sure. WNBA players. But Israel um, always has a strong WNBA presence uh, last year. Uh, there is 30 of us. It's three Americans per team. Um, there's 10 teams. And there was 12 or 13 WNBA players in the league. Um, usually Israel is getting younger players, rookie players, uh, role players uh, for sure. the most part. So they're not going to see any um, Asia Wilsons or Brianna Stewart's playing in Israel. But it's still very high level, and it's a very American-dominated league. And I think that's what makes it good because – 
Um, you know, they don't have the strongest local presence, but they have three Americans per team and you can have three Americans on the court at all times. So more, more times than not, you're going to see, you know, teams playing with their three Americans and only two uh, domestic players. So that's what makes the league competitive. So I definitely think Israel is a step up from this. Um, gotcha. But like I said, there's different levels pretty much all over uh, all over the world. Um, but this is competitive and it's good money for me. So here I am, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, speaking of levels, let's talk about the level of Chelsea Gray, the former uh, St. Mary star out in California is, is leading the Aces to the final. Just talk about the play of the recently completed um, Western final versus the Seattle team, and they knocked them off. And they're now in the finals against the, the Sun and have a 1-0 lead, and obviously game two is coming up. But uh, just talk about her play. And Ani, I mean, you can chime in too with, you know, geez, just looking at her stats and then watching her play, you're like, this girl's playing at a level not very often seen. Yeah, um, so the WNBA finals are pretty much underway, like you talked about. Game one um, already happened. The Aces ended up uh, pulling away in that game. Game two will take place Tuesday, uh, September 13th. And this has been probably the highest level WNBA finals and maybe playoffs that I've seen um, wow. in a while. Um, I'm a super WNBA advocate. I have a lot of friends. Um, you know, I bounced in and out of the league uh I had my time doing that. So I'm, I'm always watching. I'm always, you know, uh, sure. trying to support the league to my, to the best of my ability. But I think the numbers even will tell you that, you know, the WNBA is thriving right now. They're getting more viewership than they've had um, in years. I think the comparison in this finals, um, they compared it to the finals of 2012 or 2002 um, in terms of just viewers and, 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 you know, people that are engaged and, you know, let, let's just talk about the Aces. There's a lot of headlines uh, surrounding that team. Obviously, Asia Wilson, it became official. She was announced as uh, the league's MVP. Um, Becky Hammond, uh, coach of the year, first time coach of the year, first one to do it as a player, um, you know, uh, in their debut season. And then obviously Chelsea Gray, who I think has been the biggest uh, surprise of this WNBA um, kind of playoff run. Uh, Chelsea Gray is an all-star uh, all star caliber player um, in sure. this league. She's a multiple-time all-star. This year, she, uh, she actually was snubbed. Um, the Aces had four players that made the all-star game in Asia Wilson, Jackie Young, Kelsey Plum, and De'Erica Hamby. Um, and I'll be honest to say that, uh, you know, the first half of the season, which is how basically you get decided to be sure. an all-star, Chelsea Gray wasn't, wasn't as exceptional um, as we've seen her as of late. Uh, she was averaging maybe 13 points on a little bit under 40% shooting. Um, I think people that watch the Aces heavily, uh, like me, you know, me being hometown, um, know the importance of Chelsea Gray on that team. She, she's the catalyst. She's the glue girl. But but if you go by numbers, you know, she wasn't really having the strongest start to the WNBA season. And, and I think it's justified why she wasn't. Um, a WNBA All-Star this year. Sure. But I also think that the fact that she wasn't an All-Star really lit a fire under her. And I, and I think that we would not see the greatness that we're seeing of Chelsea Gray now if she wasn't pissed. She felt <laughs> like she should have been an All-Star. She feels like I belong here. I know what I do for this team. I know what I mean for this team. And the fact that she was snubbed really lit a fire in her. And she talked about it in some of her interviews, how she she put her head down, she went in the gym, and she got back to work. Because yeah. she was really hurt by the fact that, you know, she wasn't an all-star selection this year. So I think it actually worked to her benefit. I don't think that we would have seen this Chelsea Gray if she would have made an all-star. Because maybe she would have been not complacent, but just, you know, like, you kind of go through the motions when something sure. happens all the time. Um, and you just see her production. Uh, she's averaging now 23 points, uh, seven assists. Her true shooting, which I think is the most incredible thing, is 75%. I don't think that I've seen an NBA player or a WNBA player on any level at any series ever have this true shooting percentage. And, you know, Asia Wilson was the league MVP and deservingly yeah. so, but I have never seen somebody have a run like Chelsea Gray is having right now. And, sure. and, and we know that the league MVP is a regular season award, but it really made me honestly think like, wow, you know, uh, it was a tight race between, Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart, but I, I'm watching them play Seattle um, in the 
semifinals. And I'm yeah. like, Brianna Stewart doesn't have a Chelsea Gray. This girl is incredible. Brianna yeah. Stewart is guarding Asia Wilson. She, in the final game, the elimination game, she had 42 points. She had 26 at halftime. And she's guarding Asia Wilson, the league MVP. And, yep. you know, Asia Wilson was dominant in her own right. I don't want to take anything away from her. But I think the fact that Asia has a Chelsea Gray just makes her life very, very, very easy. And yeah. Chelsea Gray arguably was the best player on the floor at times yeah. in that series. So, you know, I don't want to take anything away from Asia. Um, she was the most consistent by far and 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 throughout the entire yeah. season. And that's why she deserved the award. But Chelsea Gray, having a Chelsea Gray just, you know, can certainly change things. And, and we're seeing that in her series. She's still on a tear. Um, she played excellent in game one. Uh, I felt like Connecticut had a real chance to actually yeah. uh, steal that first game. Um, but the fact of the matter is the margin of victory for the Aces in these um, semifinals and carrying on to the finals is, is, is like six points. So two possessions. And the Aces just know how to close out games and win games. They have Becky Hammond, who is exceptional um, in ATOs and drawing up plays. Then they have a lot of high caliber players that come out and execute. And, and that's the difference between, you know, um, the Aces and Seattle Storm and the Connecticut Sun is their ability to close games. So um, that's just my take on what's happening right now. I think Connecticut is going to be in the mix and have a chance to win. But just what I've seen from the Aces so far, I have a hard time believing that they don't come out this season as the WNBA champions. Looking at the Aces squad, uh, historically, you know, they end up winning the championship. How are they compared to, you know, some of the great teams in the past? Um, well, I will say that this will be a first time WNBA champion, like whoever ends up winning this finals, um, Connecticut Sun, they actually have the most, uh, playoff wins without a trophy of any team in the WNBA. So whether they win or the Aces win, it'll be a first time. Um, I think this Aces team is probably one of the most balanced teams I've seen, um, in a while. I mean, they had multiple people averaging, uh, double digit points, um, so any given night, you have a player that can score 20. I know Ronnie's a huge fan of Kelsey Plum um, and, and what she's able to do. <laughs> yeah. But Asia Wilson, Kelsey Plum, Jackie Young, even De'Erica Hamby when she wasn't injured, uh, Chelsea Gray, obviously. Any of them on any given night can give you 20 points. And, and I think when you look at most teams, like not many people have that. Like most teams are, you know, pretty much top heavy. You have two girls that are going to do – you know, something on each night and the rest of the people fall in place. So it's kind of hard to to give a, a comparison just collectively as a team. I, I'm personally a fan of the older, older WNBA teams that a lot of people, you know, me just being a historian of the game, um, you know, like the Comets, like teams that went on runs of, of multiple sure. championships and stuff like where well, I don't think that you're really going to see that again. And I don't think that these teams compare to those teams because they were just so dominant. Um, but the Aces, they're, they're incredible, and I really see them winning the championship, and I think that this will go down as a special season considering that they just are sweeping all the awards and, you know, they were preseason picked to, to win the championship, and, and they have a chance to kind of follow through with that. Yeah, I, I piggybacking with, on what you said, Ani, like, why well, see, like, the play at a really high level? I've watched a little bit of almost – every WNBA season. I and I watch the comments a lot because it was new. Right. I knew who the girls were. Tina Thompson's from LA, Cynthia Cooper's from LA. Yep. And everybody knows Cheryl Swoops at that time. She was pretty popular. And yeah, you know, have three great players like that and they want four straight. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to set the bar for a good while. You know, like those three players were pretty phenomenal and they had some pretty good role players, but I don't think the level of play, there's no girl doing what Chelsea Gray is doing right now then. <laughs> Right. You know, like just the 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 difficulty of shots she's taking and making. Like I'm watching, I'm like, is she playing this guy? I'm like, oh yeah, she's playing this good. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it? Chelsea, let's just talk about the basketball step and the basketball for a bit. Is it uh you look at Chelsea and from what I know of her in the past, she maybe again, I'm not trying to knock her. Hope if she's listening, hope she doesn't get mad. She could be five to ten pounds overweight a lot. So she's in good shape right now. You know, I've seen her before. Yeah, she looks uh, She moved, has the old man game or the old woman game, you want to call it, which a lot of girls have, and there's nothing wrong with that. But, like, the amount of sh the spots she's getting to and the difficulties of shots she's making, 
what is it? Is it just her comfort level, her comfort level in the team, or is she just that good? Her obviously her uh, ability to go both directions is good. Her ability to stop is good. Her ability to shoot in a defender's face is good. But so what? So what is it there? I mean, Chelsea Gray is is super unique um, in terms of just like you talked about her body type yeah. um, and just you know traditionally playing the position. Um, yeah. She doesn't play. Uh, based off a lot of athleticism and speed. Um, she's typically a little bit taller than the average point guard in the league. Oh, yeah. um, and, you know, most of the times her being a bigger body too, uh, she's not usually matching up with the point yeah. guard of the opposing team. Um, a lot of times you see Chelsea Gray, and she's an excellent defender, by the way. She doesn't have really the lateral movement and lateral quickness of, you know, most point guards, but, you know, she knows how to take a charge. She knows how to be in the right place at the right time. Sure. She's going to use your body. She's going to use angles. She's going to use strength. Um, so she's honestly just mastered, um, you know, the ability to, you know, be effective in, in, in not such a traditional way. Um, but I think what helps her um, is her basketball IQ. Um, sure. super smart, you know, student of the game. She's going to do her scouting report. She's going to know the other team's weaknesses. She's going to be aware of all of her um, teammates' weaknesses. And, and she knows how to capitalize on that. Um, and and she's she has this fadeaway that is, I think, like the most unstoppable move in women's basketball right now because she's going to get to her spot and you're going to cut her off because you're faster than her. And then she's just going to get up, rise up, and she's going to fade. And you can't block it. You can't contest it. Um, she, like I said, she gets to her spots, which is usually around either elbow towards the top of the key. Um, she's shooting, you know, two and three dribble pull-ups and it, it's super effective. Um, I will say that I think Connecticut may be onto something at the end of, uh, game one, uh, the aces had the ball. There's about 23 seconds, um, on the clock and Connecticut actually mixed it up and they put Alyssa Thomas on Chelsea Gray. So Chelsea Gray has been unstoppable. She's been killing everybody. Um, the starting point guard for Connecticut is Natisha Heidman, who's smaller in stature, shorter in stature. Um, although she's a lot faster, uh, she's really just too little. Like, I feel like a traditional point guard struggles with Chelsea Gray because she doesn't have the body of a point guard. So yeah. um, Connecticut switched it up. It's the final possession, basically, for the Aces. They're up three. And then they put Alyssa Thomas, who was the uh, second uh, runner up for defensive player of the year beside behind Asia Wilson. Um, but, she, but she's big. She's tall. She's strong. She's mobile. She's fast. They put her on Chelsea Gray. Chelsea Gray had her on an island at the top of the key. And, and Alyssa Thomas got the stop. Um, she uh, Chelsea Gray went into, you know, rocking her to sleep, uh, pulled back into her fadeaway shot. Alyssa, uh, Alyssa Thomas got a hand on it. Um, Connecticut gets the ball with, I think, 14 seconds on the clock and a chance to tie the game and to go into overtime. So I don't know if that's a matchup that we'll see um, a little bit more regularly here in this game, too. Um, but I think that's the way to go when guarding Chelsea Gray. And I also yeah. think people need to make Chelsea go to the basket. If, if I'm guarding Chelsea, she's already bigger. She's already stronger. You know, if you have a little bit of quickness and stuff on her, you need to make her keep the ball on the floor and go all the way to the basket and finish that way you look at most of her shots they're all mid-range numbers they're threes at yeah. the top of the key she's not really getting into the paint but mainly because asia wilson is posting up there but i'm just saying like it, it, i would yeah. make her be a driver i would make her be a slasher because right now she's shooting out of her mind and there's just hasn't been an answer for it so i, I think we'll see a little bit more of the Alyssa thomas matchup i still don't think that chelsea gray is going to be able to be stopped um, because she's just too smart and she's going to find a way to be effective either way. So to answer your question, yes, she is that good. Um, and that's what we're seeing while the ace is on this run. Gotcha. Now, Tuesday night's game two, is that basically it for Connecticut? Do or die, they got to win it, right? They can't go down 2-0 in a five-game series. This is basically the series for them, this this game. Well, you watch this pod, this game will probably be on or you'll know what happened. But is this game two basically do or die? No, it's not. No, I mean, Connecticut... Did you see the last series, Connecticut, in the semifinals? They were playing against the Chicago Sky. Yeah. Um, they shocked everybody by winning game one. Um, then they lost two games in a row. So they lost uh, game two on Chicago's home court because Chicago had the home court advantage. Then they sure. lost game three in Connecticut, and everybody thought that they were done. Um, but yeah. they come back and they close out, and they win game four by a 20-point margin. And then in game five, they look dead in the water as well. They're down nine points with – four minutes and 20 seconds to go. And they end up beating the defending champs 
um, and shocking everybody again. So I don't think that game two is do or die. And I think if I'm the Connecticut Sun, I feel good about what happened in game one. I'm going into game two, making a little bit of adjustments, figuring out how we can capitalize on some things that we didn't do great. But, you know, if you're a coach, you, ideally, if you are – uh, the team that doesn't have home court advantage and you're playing on the road, the objective in the first two games is to split. So they still have that chance. And even if you don't split, you still have, you know, your home games, which you can win those. And ultimately you're going to have to win, you know, in Vegas at some point in time. But I don't think that they're dead in the water. And I do give them a chance to to win game two. Great. Wow. Yeah. That'd be an interesting game. Like you said, this fan support has been good. Uh, obviously in Vegas, people are supporting the aces. So let's say devil's advocate, the aces win the series. What does that mean for the people of Las Vegas? What does it mean for the franchise? What does it just mean to people who watch sports in Vegas? Well, I think it's incredible because Vegas is becoming a sports town. This is going to be the first professional championship um, that Las Vegas has ever had because, you know, we're just new to getting NFL uh, we're new to WNBA. We're supposed to have a, a MLB team here and we're supposed to get um, an NBA team coming soon. But uh, this will be the first of many, hopefully, in, in Vegas becoming a sports town. Um, so I yeah. think it's going to be incredible. And, you know, I've been to pretty much 90 percent of the Vegas home games um, when I'm home. And the support has been exceptional. It's been incredible. The city has really got behind um, the Aces. And, you know, they have arguably the most fans in the league for a, for a franchise that hasn't been, you know, around that long. Um, and I think it's only going to get greater from here. So uh, I know, you know, my mom has become an Aces fan and everybody's excited, you know, to see them do something special. So uh, I think it'll be um, awesome for the city and I'm looking forward to, you know, hopefully um, getting some championships here for, for some other um, sports um, as we start to get these teams. Sure. Um, Ani, talk a little bit about uh, Serena and Serena Williams. Uh, did you watch any of the matches that she lost? Obviously, she she went to the, what the quarterfinal or yeah, maybe third, the second third round. round. Third round. Third round. Third round. And uh, a lot of people were watching. You know, what's your take there? Obviously, we talked about the Houston Comets. She kind of broke in right around that time. Doesn't seem like it, but she's been around quite a long time, and she's she's stepping down as a tennis player and. You know, watching her, I mean, everybody was talking about it. So kind of what was your take? And then, you know, what does she mean? Yeah, I'm a big tennis fan. That's uh, I grew up watching a lot of tennis. Um, yeah. Serena Williams and Serena and Venus was where I just really started, you know, really yeah. watching. So, you know, going back to the U.S. Open, uh, I thought she I thought she did good. I thought she should have won that third round game. Uh, mm -hmm. Her opponent, you know, just really capitalized on her mistakes. Uh, she had a lot of errors, especially on the serve. Uh, yeah. But, I thought Serena was – I thought she was – I thought she was good. I thought she would at least made it to the quarterfinals, uh, maybe the semis. I didn't think she would win the U.S. Open. She was still rusty. You can tell us that she's taking a lot of time off. Uh, sure. Especially just with everything, just her, her some of her shots uh, that we, we typically, you know, would see her execute on. Um, but, you know, like Serena, just her legacy. I mean, that's, that's, that's the GOAT right there. Um, you yeah. know, really transcended the game. Uh, just how tennis is played, like, you know, some how the players, like when they when her and Venus first came out, like the power that they really hit with their shots and everything, it was like no one's seen that. But now you see you see more of that from the women uh, tennis players. Uh, from Coco, there's multiple women, women that are playing this ga uh, game. You know, they're, it's, a di they, it's different, and that's due to Serena. <laughs> uh, they, had, they, had, they had that down in order to. Sure in order to compete. So, um, no, that's the goat. I mean, what, 23 uh, Grand Slam titles, I believe. Um, you know, if she, you know, there was some, there was some, if you look back, you know, some of the ones she lost back then, some of the time when the time she took time off and, you know, yeah. it was rusty. Like, you could, like, she, she could have easily had 30. But uh, just going back to that US Open, it was just fun just to see her. I haven't really watched tennis that heavy in about five to six years. So sure. it was fun just kind of going back. Like, I was watching women's doubles. I was watching the men's. Like, just – I was, like, big just watching tennis. <laughs> like, I never played. <laughs> you know, my family. Yeah, yeah. But in Nigerian culture, we love tennis. We call it long tennis. Uh, so uh, we love watching 
uh, tennis. So I never played, but Serena, you know, that's the goat right there. Uh, I thought her performance was great. It was just fun seeing her out there. Uh, the way she played, you felt like she could go out and do that again with more time in practice. So, that gotcha. Was my- yeah. How about you, Chelsea? Well, I'll tell you, I was up at three in the morning watching this match. And when Serena lost, I cried. Like Serena is my favorite, favorite athlete of all time. And I have never played tennis. Um, I had a really close childhood friend who grew up playing tennis. So I always kind of had a little interest because of her. Sure. Um, but just being a black girl, just watching Serena, um, just watching the way she carried herself, just watching the dominance in a predominantly white sport, um, just watching, you know, just the way she carried herself and, and the way that she's paved the way for, for girls like myself has always been something that's been so admirable and, and for, forget her as a player. I mean, she has what a 84% like win percentage. They said she's yeah. 858 uh, wins to 156 losses. Um, so, you know, besides just being the best, I think just the cultural um, effect and the impact that she's had on, on, on black girls that, you know, want to be dominant in something and, and, you know, need to see themselves. I think representation is just so important. And I know she's basically paved the way um, for a lot of us. So I think that's why it was emotional for me. And then too, I think it was emotional because it's like, you see how somebody who's given their all to one thing for so long to see them have to kind of walk away for it or walk away from it or think that they're going to walk away from it. And I'm kind of getting to that point. So I just thought like, dang, like, is this what it feels like? Serena was crying and she's saying like, these are happy tears, I think, like, or I guess like maybe I'm leaving, you know, like even the uncertainty crept in like right there in that moment in her final interview. And it was just like, wow, like what a career Um, to me. She goes down as probably the greatest athlete of all time, period. Like I've seen a lot of lists um, lately. And I don't want to say that just because she's a woman, but one thing that sticks out to me when I've seen these lists I'm seeing Michael Jordan. I'm seeing Tom Brady. I'm seeing Babe Ruth. Like all these people are playing team sports. Like at the end of the day, Serena had to stand on that tennis court by herself. It's just me and you, you know, I don't have a a Steve Kerr to hit a shot to help me win a championship. I don't have, you know, Gronk and all these people that have assisted in in, in Tom Brady's excellence. And, and these people are excellent in their own right. Like I don't want to take anything away from them, but I think it's just different. To, sure. to play an individual sport and have it be all on you, all on your shoulders, as opposed to some of these greats that, you know, have benefited from having teams and having teammates. So when I look at it, you know, I, I think the dominance um, of her as an individual is just second to none. And like I said, when I combine that with the cultural impact, um, you know, she's she's it for me. She's definitely the GOAT. Gotcha. Ani, where is she at on your list, man? Where is, she, is she four, three, five, seven? Who I never even really thought about it in that, that, but I would say top five for sure. Um, sure. And you know, when you talk about how, like Chelsea makes a point about it's an individual game, right? Yeah. Like you know how long like a set is, like they got to win. Mm-hmm. Was it two women have to win two sets? Like if it gets into five sets, like those games are three four hours long. Like you know how yeah. how focused yeah. you have to be just to win that, and then. Two days later, you're playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I would say top five. I never really w- had a list like that. never really thought sure. of one. Um, I just really appreciate greatness. But yeah. uh, she's no-brainer top five. But, I mean, I'm just like, once that one time lasted like an hour, I think, in a third-round game. And I'm like, oh, crap, like, <laughs> like yeah. I really pay attention for 30 minutes, you know, like just having that much focus. <laughs> Well, yeah, and also she's playing against girls that really, realistically, could be like almost her daughters. Yeah. You know what I mean? They could really be her daughters <laughs> if she had a baby at a young 20, 21 years old, 22 years old. It's like, that's pretty amazing. I guess that's pretty amazing from looking at Tom Brady as well. Like, So in the turn of the century when the Comets were winning their championships and Serena was just coming on the scene, all this stuff came out in the newspapers and Sports Century. I'm sure you guys might remember some of the series a little bit. They they get replayed once in a while. Sports Century had all these series about all the great athletes. And it was basically, I was telling my friends we were watching at the time because they were counted down from like 100. And I was like, it's going to be Babe Ruth, 
Michael Jordan and Muhammad Ali. They're like, oh, I think it's going to be Babe Ruth number one. He's old and people love him. And I was like, nah, I'll be Jordan because people, it's current. And so I was like, Muhammad Ali probably be two. So it just ended up being those three guys. So Babe Ruth was three. Ali was two. Jordan was one. And in those 20 years, really, that hasn't changed in, in those lists you're talking about, Chelsea. But to say Tom Brady and now Serena have gone come into them, like Tom Brady was still in college at that time. Yeah. So I, I like I, uh, those haven't changed that much. I don't even recall who was four and five then because it's like not even important. Like they're those three guys were so far <laughs> ahead of whoever four and five. Four might have been like Joe Montana. I, I don't recall. But like Serena and Tom Brady have just broken in and are going to be here for a long, long, long time. Like nobody's going to break into. I don't think nobody's going to break into that top five. If you guys say that's the top five for a long time, who else would it be? You know, like athletes well, are. You know, bronze in my in my top, but that's you know, yeah, yeah. A, a, yeah, that's for another like, show and for another day. Yeah, um, I forgot about Muhammad Ali, but I still think there's something that has to be yeah. said about doing something individually. I'm sorry, oh, Muhammad Ali, like, like, like that me. has yeah. to, yeah, yeah, like that has to mean something. Yeah, you know, the rest of the people are team sports, and I forgot about Muhammad Ali until you mentioned him. But yeah, you know, to stand there. in the ring. And be by yourself. Yeah. It's different. And, and he's very important to like the people, our parents' ages, because there was so much going on at the time, Vietnam War, America was changing. So Muhammad Ali means everything to a lot of people. People that yeah. are basically baby boomers in, in that in that age. So yeah, that's awesome. And you know, I've i when I think about Serena, to be honest with you guys, uh sometimes I obviously she's from around here where I grew up. So I think about that, I'm like, man. Uh, I hope I see more um, Serena Williams. What I mean by that is, like, does everybody have the opportunity to play tennis, to be pushed to tennis, to be pushed really good at it? Because I'm, like, thinking, I know a lot of girls who were, like, really good athletes, and they were just they, – they didn't – at the time, the WNBA wasn't around when I was in junior high and, and elementary, and they're like, eh, I'm not going to play for the team, Ronnie. I'm like, no, you just, you're pretty good. Like – you should be playing hoop or whatever. And, uh, you know, like, yeah. I just wish there was more people with the opportunity to play tennis. So, like, the next Serena Williams could have a rival, Serena Williams. Because, like yeah. you said, her shooting per or her, her shooting percentage, her winning percentage <laughs> is, like, 84%. Because she's really dominating. Like you said, Ana, she's dominating. She could win even more majors. So, I just hope that the next Serena Williams has, like, her rival. You know what I mean? Be, and there's, I don't, there's more I don't think it's gonna be close, but I get no? what you're saying, and I'm hopeful. Yeah. You know, yeah. now I've moved on to Coco. You know, that's yeah. who I'm following. Um, yeah. I was following Osaka for a little bit. You know, the Japanese American, yeah. um, you know, tennis player. So, sure. you know, I, I just can't see it though. Like to be no. dominant for so long. Another yeah. interesting thing that I found out about Serena was that she was number one for 319 weeks. Mm -hmm. Like Ooh. 319 <laughs> weeks. Like. I, I just can't see it. I can't see anybody beating that. Um, yeah. But I think it's good to have these people that have done that because then people have, you know, somebody to chase. You know, LeBron yeah. has chased Michael Jordan, so he says, you know, for most of his career. So I think it drives you. It motivates you. And to yeah. see that somebody else has done something, you know, gives you hope that you can do it or you can even do more. And, and I think yeah. people need them. So it's good. Yeah. She's a unique situation with her sister. And I was just saying, man, like, you know, you don't, when I grew up, tennis wasn't really in the realm of anything in L.A. at the time. Um, I guess it's a niche sport. Or maybe it's even a, a a rich sport or a sport where the affluence comes in. Mm -hmm. So that's a unique situation she was pushed to. So I just hope more and more girls play tennis. But as you mentioned, Chelsea, even if she inspires girls to do better in school or to play basketball or to play softball, then it's still good. Like no, she's still absolutely. inspiring. She's still inspiring. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that 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 that's a uh, awesome and kudos to her, kudos to everybody that's helped her along the way. Uh, let's switch gears a bit here. Um, Ani, let's talk about the person, the young man rapper who was in LA. Speaking of LA, mm -hmm. recently, and he passed away. I don't know much about him as a rapper, but I'm sure he was popular and talented. He was 30 years old. Just talk a little bit about that, your first reaction to that. on it. Obviously, it's not a good reaction, but what, just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's been crazy <clears throat> just in L.A. Uh, I mean, just a lot of – when you talk about – I think Pop Smoke even got killed in L.A., did he not? Mm -hmm. uh, 
there, you know, I was reading a bunch of articles just about rappers getting killed in LA. This is just a sure. one. Um, and just rappers are targeted. <laughs> uh, there was, well, there's one from Texas that uh, was getting robbed and then he killed somebody. His people killed somebody uh, that was trying to rob him. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, it's sad, but it's becoming a constant thing <laughs> uh, in the past couple of years. And, you know, we talked about a little bit before the show about like, you know, some of them have to check in with some gangs, you know, to get protection. Uh, sure. There's one, there's ones that just, you know, it's, it's, it'd be a beef. Uh, and then, or that or maybe a small beef, and then you know, guys are coming to get them. <laughs> um, sure, a lot, of, a lot of it they're just targeted because of their money and their status. Uh, being a rapper is not the safest thing to be. Uh, mm-hmm. I love rap, obviously, I listen to hip hop all day, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, but in LA, it just you know, guys are getting targeted more. Uh, as, as we've seen, like you've seen guys, uh, houses getting robbed, you've seen guys getting uh, shot at, like you know, just in their cars getting robbed in the street, broad daylight, too. <laughs> like, we're not talking about, yeah, like, in the night, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. dude getting got like in during the day. So, I just think when you're, um, when you're a hip hop artist, I just think you just gotta be careful when you're in LA. It's sad. Um, I mean, I mean, look. I say that, but in Dallas, like Mo three two years ago, got shot in the highway, got mm-hmm. killed in the highway in broad daylight. Uh, young Dolph <laughs> got killed in Memphis. You know, getting uh, uh, cookies for his, uh, his mom. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, this it's just it's what's going on. But I mean, you hate to see it, but you see it in L.A. It's being more, it's happening more. Just with you know, rappers getting you know getting robbed, getting killed, and um, you know, this is just one of many. You know, you talk about the last. Yeah. Spe- Five years we talk about even going with Biggie, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, you know, it just it's a lot, it's just it's just a lot, it's, it, but it's been more of a thing the past five years, yeah. Chelsea, what do you what, what is your thoughts on the young young man who, who passed away? Yeah, uh, PNB Rock is his name, uh, he's from Philly actually, and sure. you know, I know him pretty well because he's around my age, so I've listened to him. Um, he raps, he sings a little bit, he's done a lot of of features. He has a couple of hit songs of his own, but you know, he's been featured on songs with a lot of popular people. Um, and you know, it's, this is like just scary times. Like when I see yeah. and hear about all the things that are happening, like to me, it's just like unheard of. And, you know, I talked to Ronnie about this in, in terms of like just other instances and stuff, but like even hearing about what happened yesterday, um, you know, I'm on Twitter, the video of him actually bleeding out in Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles has circulated online. And sure. I, I try to avoid that stuff because, you know, we have come, be, uh, we have become so desensitized to traumatic things. Like it's not normal and it's not okay to circulate these type of videos and have us, you know, be, have so much access to them. Ca- so, break them down and stuff. Yeah. yeah. What, Comment what, on them. Yeah. Yeah. I heard this happen. And one, I felt for his girlfriend because they're totally, totally victimizing her at this moment. Um, I guess she, you know, kind of shared the location of where they were eating. Um, so everybody's pretty much blaming her um, for why this happened. But my thing is, is we'll put more blame on the girlfriend than we will the actual shooter. Right. Like, you yeah. know, this this woman has been with him for several years. Um, he has two kids. I'm not sure if one of the kids is with this young lady, but you know, this is probably the most devastating day of her life, you know, it, it, I can I imagine. That. And to have people on social media saying that she should kill herself and this was a setup and all this kind of stuff is just unheard of because everybody is an investigator and everybody, you know, yeah. thinks that they need to take these moments and have them be teachable moments when the only thing you should offer is condolences. A man lost his life. A girl lost her boyfriend. Possibly, you know, the the dad of her child. Like I said, I'm not sure if they have the kid together. But this stuff has become way too normal. Um, I don't like seeing this type of stuff on social media in terms of just the videos circulating because I feel it's just disrespectful to the family. And, you know, maybe you don't know something like, like I look at Kobe's incident, which, you know, was obviously a crash. But Vanessa said she didn't hear about it until on social media where people are saying Kobe died. Like, yeah. you don't even give the family a chance to to find out what's happened, to hear about it. These celebrities, you know, the news spreads like wildfire and it's just not fair. So for me, it, it's just a sad situation. Like you said, LA is just very scary right now. There's a lot of different things going on there. Sure. And 
you know, I think there's lessons, you know, to be learned in anything. Like, you know, if you are any type of somebody, like even if you're not, you know, you can be robbed. So you always have to be aware of your surroundings. Um, sure. But I just think about too, like, you know, I wish you would have had some type of security. Um, I also know that the east side of LA is just not safe. So I just can't imagine like, if you don't have any business there, he's not from there. I know he's from Philly. Um, you know, I right. don't really know why he was there, but you know, I don't want to put that blame and shame on anybody that's a victim. I just think that it's unfortunate that we have to think about this kind of stuff all the time. Oh, no, no, everybody, no that even, everybody that Ani mentioned, like are doing regular things, going to get cookies, like, yeah. you know, um, Nipsey's just chilling at his, his shop and he, he created, you know, this, this community of, of shops for people in his community. And he was killed right in front. Like, you know, where could we go? What could we do and, and actually be safe? Cause it's like nowhere safe. You always have to have security. You know, people should not be killed for having nice things. Like, I understand that maybe you shouldn't floss all the time, but if I worked hard for something and I want to have a nice chain or a nice car, I should have a right to. And somebody yeah. shouldn't kill me or rob me be because of it, you know? So it really just makes me sick and it makes me really sad. And I just always think about the kids and the families and the loved ones, um, you know, that lives are changed forever because of something so senseless and stupid. Like, Yeah, it's very senseless. The, the, the killing of him is very senseless. Again, like you mentioned, some dudes are going to try to rob somebody, but then you just took their life, his life for no reason. Um I, I, you know, it, there's a lot of things like you guys said going on in L.A. There's a lot of things to discuss in terms of what could have happened, what should have happened, what didn't happen. But at the end of the day, somebody took his life and we're blaming somebody else that didn't wasn't the perpetrator or yeah, wasn't yeah. the person who, who who was, you know, committed the crime. At the end of the day, somebody committed a crime. Right. You know, and, and yeah. Like, talk about a million different things. We shouldn't be blaming his girlfriend about that. I mean, it's just sad that you have to watch you posting a picture of yourselves eating <laughs> because someone could use that location and come kill you. You yeah. know, like, that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's one thing you got to think about. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, I even, I, I don't, I don't, I, I highly doubt anyone. Honey, I hope you don't post pictures of yourself eating all the time. Please no, tell I me don't. you go. I, I, I do, rarely, though. I, Chelsea I, I does. Ra Chelsea I rarely does. post. But I'd be thinking yeah. like, OK, I got like sometimes I'd be thinking like that. I'm like, but just seeing all these things, you get yeah. kind of paranoid sometimes when you post like, OK, I, I got to make sure this ain't, you know, like and I, I ain't them, <laughs> yeah. you know, but you just I get paranoid. That does bring some level of paranoia to me because you just see someone post a picture. Then someone finds a location, and kills them. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting in L.A. Again, we're talking about mostly the places that. Me living here my whole life, I know exactly what, where he's at, where he was doing, that kind of thing. And I could just picture him. Again, he maybe knew somebody over there, but if you're going to Roscoe's, you're going to go to the one on Pico. Mm -hmm. Especially if you get off the, from LAX or something. If you're going south, you'll probably go to one, especially now, Inglewood is like a touristy area now. So you'll mm -hmm. go to the one in Inglewood, especially with the stadium there. And like Inglewood is almost gentrifying a bit. That's unheard of. When I was in school, Inglewood was like the hood. Yeah. And it still is has a hood reputation. Everybody knows the city because of movies, because of athletes, things like that. It's changing. But like people don't just go to Manchester and Maine. You just don't go there like, oh, yeah, Ani, I'm going to take you over there right now. Oh, you're you're here from <laughs> Dallas. Oh, yeah, let's go over here to Manchester. Like you don't do that. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't mean, mean you have the right to, but you just don't do that. You know, so it's very interesting when people talk about LA. And I even seen the. Some news outlets are saying, and I feel bad for the establishment in on Inglewood because they're saying he got killed at Ro Chicken and Waff Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles in Inglewood. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was at the one on Manchester and Maine. You know, so it's a little east, four or five miles east, whatever it is, three miles. I don't know, like exactly, but that that's kind of unfortunate. So we have these stereotypes of where people should go and shouldn't go, and I'm sure Chelsea, you kind of mentioned your your story with Don Staley and Temple and how your mom wasn't really didn't want you to be there. And that stuff you have to think about all the time, like where you're going, what you're wearing, who you're going with, what time you leave, where you park. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about that just real briefly. Like 
is it pre prevalent? I know, Ani, you mentioned you think about it a little bit. I think about it in a different way when I'm in L.A., but Chelsea, you being a woman, what do you, how prevalent really is it? Like, yeah, I, for me, I just, you know. It, it's more just the woman aspect of it. Yeah, like, yeah. I am super aware of my surroundings just, you know, yeah. because of that. Like, you know, sex trafficking being from Las Vegas is like a real thing. And, real you know, thing, yeah. I... I have known people that have been caught up in that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. you know, that's always the biggest thing that crosses my mind, just as a woman. M you know, I share my location, my brother, my mom. They, my brother doesn't even live in Vegas, but he just wants to be able to randomly look sometimes and, you know, see where I am. Um, but just, you know, always being in open areas. Uh, I go to a lot of sneaker stores, a lot of malls and stuff like that. I'm parking in well-lit areas. I don't really go too many places at night by myself. Um, even when I go to a lounge and stuff like that, I have a lot of brothers um, and just guys that I grew up with and close with that are always with me. Um, and, and and I'm a nobody, but it's just a protection thing because it's just scary. Like, you don't even have to be somebody to be robbed or killed or kidnapped. Like, really, you yeah. don't. And that's what what I've come to realize. Um, so, you know, for me, it's just, just about being aware of surroundings. And I think everybody, it's sad that, you know, that's what we have to focus on. But these are the times that we're in. And it's not exclusive to L.A. It's just L.A. is, you know, killing a lot of big time people. But, you know, we, we see violent crimes and stuff happening every day everywhere. And, yeah. you know, it's just it, like it's unfortunate. Like, I can't believe some of the stuff that happens. I really just cannot. Like, but this is the situation that we're in. And everybody has to be conscious um, of just the things that they post and where they are in their surroundings. And, you know, especially if you're a woman, I think um, it's even worse. So. Yeah, I just think perception is big. Perception is big. Um, obviously, in L.A., people are following people to their affluent homes on the west side, whether it's like Brentwood, uh, Bel Air. People go eat, and somebody will follow them and rob and ride in front of their home. What's the perception? They have money. But also the perception is they're not going to resist. If you have a nice house and have jewelry, you're not going to resist. Right. The thieves know that they're probably not okay. I'm gonna go rob a dude on Manchester in Maine, or I'm gonna go rob somebody in Bel Air. I, I mean, I don't mean to laugh, but I'm gonna probably rob the person in Bel Air because they're right. gonna. The chances are they have something, and the chances are they're not gonna resist. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's basically it's perception. It's not really reality. It's just that person could have a gun or have security, but that's that's the perception of it. And then perception of a rapper is he has jewelry, he has money on him. That's not necessarily true, but it's a big perception. You know what I mean? And I know somebody's thinking about that, about, uh, the you know, the rapper who just died, especially if he goes to that location with a nice car. I'm sure he was wasn't in a bucket. Right. That's another. He wasn't in a bucket. Uh, funny. Uh, uh, a writer just told me, he goes, Ronnie, I was I go. I was joking with him because he's he's from DMV. And I bet I was telling him, I go, you've never been on the east side. He's Chris Palmer. He's written a lot of. of yeah, 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 I yeah Chris, you know, he mm -hmm. writes NBA books. He writes stuff. He goes, well, one time I went with Andre Miller. And we just got in a bucket and drove around L.A. And he was telling me some of the stuff where he lives, where he grew up. He's all, but we were in a bucket. He's on. He, we was on purpose because, like you said, Andre Miller's not going to go on the east side with a hundred twenty thousand dollar car. You know, what I mean? he's just not. And it kind of sucks that we have to live by all these rules, but we do live by them. You know what I mean? We regardless of whether we think about it or not, subconsciously we do. And it's funny in L.A. as well. It's supposed to be, it used to be a place where celebrity's not a big thing. Now, again, if you're Tom Brady or Serena Williams or Michael Jordan, you're huge regardless of where you're at, right? You probably have security. But, like, a second-tier star is not supposed to be bothered in L.A. Like, that's what L.A. is known for. You know what I mean? Tina Thompson, nobody will bother her. Andre Miller, nobody bothers him, asks for him autographs. But it's like, now it's to the point, I guess, because of what we're going through Socially and economically, like people are targets all over. And another thing I'll mention is the statistics. I think it's the way uh, the ethos of the media now and our access to it. L.A. is a much safer city than it was in the 1980s. Statistically, it is. It still really? is. Even though we're talking about like the crime wave of the last few years since COVID and that, like it's still much more safe now. But wow. it's just the way it's being presented. You know what I mean? It's scary because 
everybody talks about it. My mom talks about it. My dad, you know, like, I don't want to leave the house as much right now. Yeah, I can see why. Because it's it's just the way the the media presents things and it's very powerful. And, and I think uh, the one thing that brought to my attention was uh, something that hit to, close to me was the lady Kim Glass who got hit with like a bolt downtown L.A., Mm-hmm. Um, a volleyball player, you a uh, yeah. U.S. Olympian. Well, yeah. she was on the cover of our old student sports magazine as a volleyball player in high school. She was a star, so I'll never forget. I'm like Kim Glass. I was like, that's Kim Glass. And people think, uh, you know, the man hit her randomly. She obviously was an awful visual. When you see her yeah. face, she's all busted up. But like everybody knows that that person now knows that that person like was out on the streets and and had a previous charge for something similar. So everybody thinks there's all these crazy people that should be in jail on the street. So everybody's like wigged out, especially when you hear stories like that. Mm. So very interesting. The Olympics are coming in 228 to out Los Angeles. And I guarantee you guys now, hopefully we're still doing this spot. I don't know where you guys would be, but in 228, the Olympics come to LA. They're going to be cleaning stuff up. They're going to be trying to cut down on crime a lot in those times leading up to Olympics, just like they did in 1984. When I was a young boy, they, oh, you got a speeding ticket? You got a warrant? Arrested. Arrested. Arrest. They were arresting people left and right leading up to those 84 Olympics. Not talked about a lot, but it's well known. Because, again, there was a lot of crime at the time, and they were trying to clean up the perception of things, how safe, how safe things are. So that's kind of what we're going through right now. It's a bad time, and the perception is this is a bad time. So... It, it, I hopefully it changes. Hopefully we don't have a many more incidents like this, but you know, it, it's very important to talk about and I appreciate your guys insight. So let's, let's jump gears to actually talk a little bit about basketball. Ani, uh, let's talk a little bit about the gasso that you're at. Uh, where was it at? And you know, what, what was it a uh, uh, grassroots in a dead period or was it individual? Uh, <clears throat> it was a, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, it was a scholastic. So it was just a team. Oh, so gasso, high school team. Show. Yeah. So we uh, it's usually like the tip off for like major fall showcases. So, um, you know, Ron Holland, Duncanville played uh, Ron Holland, uh, two twenty three, uh, consensus top ten to twelve player in the country. He was really good. Uh, yeah. just used his athleticism at six eight. The shooting has gotten a lot better, especially in the mid range game. The handle, uh, just his defense, defensive versatility. You know, he's a guy that uh, you know, even NBA got, NBA scouts have been kind of looking at. You know, for that next next level. So uh, he was really good. Just his versatility and his improved shooting and handle. Uh, Arizona commit uh, uh, KJ Lewis, who's also on that Duncanville squad uh, sure. from El Chapin. Uh, just a strong body, athletic, like wing guard type. Uh, Ronnie got to see him at Pangos. Uh, got got to see him. You know, I've seen him a lot over the sure. year. But, uh, you know, just like, just again, like Duncanville is such a defensive, uh, <laughs> like defensively, they're so good. Uh, not as talented as last year when you had Anthony Black uh, with Ron Holland. Um, yeah. You know, you just had a, they were just loaded. Uh, yeah. and, uh, Ashton Hardaway. Ashton Whoa. Hardaway, who's at Sierra Canyon now. Like, <clears throat> you yeah. know, they were loaded, <laughs> you know, they're not as loaded this year, but they still keep the same defense intensity, but KJ Lewis and Ron Holland, definitely bright spots uh, there. Uh, Dink Pate, who's a 224 uh, kid from Pinkston high school, uh, six, seven, he's a guard, uh, you know, more of like your two, one combo type uh, there. He was really good. I mean, like he's had a good end of July to early August. I think, it de- I think team Trey young, did some stuff in the August when they came to mm-hmm. LA and I heard he played pretty good because Jacoby Walters, uh, I think was at Dame, Dame, Dame's uh, camp, but you know, just you really showcase his perimeter skills. His shot creation has gotten a lot better. His intensity on the defense and then rebounding is good. That pinks and teams, not the most talented group, but Dink really like shoulders the load and does a lot on both ends. I just really like how he's improved as a shooter. Uh, John Calipari is actually here today <laughs> to uh, watch him. So, uh, you know, he's a kid. I think he's a top 30 player in his class in the country. I think he's really under uh, rated as far as just where his ranking is compared to what he is. And uh, sure. it'll be interesting to see just his recruitment. Uh, I mean, there's some stuff kind of going out, may go go to the pro route, you know, may, uh, you know, go blue blood. Uh, that kid, you know, he uh, he's an old school kid. I got, I know, I know Dink for a little bit. You know, he listens to Tupac <laughs> all the time. <laughs> hey, you know? I like Dink. <laughs> 
Yeah, I he, like he, pink. He'll rock a two box shirt. Like I'm telling you, just old school. Like, <laughs> I watch old school movies, everything. So uh, it was really good just to see Dink uh, really perform uh, out there. Um, uh, Qual Attack. He's a kid from Haltom City. I got to see him early June. Uh, six nine Sudanese kid. Um, looks mm-hmm. very young. They said the dad's like seven foot. He's about 6'9". He's a 2024 kid. He's a late bloomer. Uh, I think he's a national top 100 type player um, in the in his class. Uh, just Qual's versatility, shooting. He's got good footwork. The handle's there. Good feel as a passer. Um, Qual attack from Haltom City. I think he's a high major player. Mississippi State just offered, I think, yesterday. Mm. Um, so, you know, he – I mean, he's a kid. I was like – I went up to Sean War because that's where um, – <clears throat> Greg Garrick Norman plays. He's he committed to Michigan State. Anthony Black played for him, and I'm like, damn it, Sean, you got another one. Like, yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, he's he's a kid about six nine. He may end up being seven foot, and you know, just being one of those skilled forward type guys. I mean, Qualls is really really talented. Uh, homeschool Tiger Storm Darkon King. A uh, and M offered him. He plays for uh, the infamous John Yuri. The Houston superstars in the summer uh, was really good. Uh, just a skilled forward with size. It's always interesting. People ask about his level, uh, level of play, uh, like what what he is because he's like he's an under the rim guy, but he's just so skilled yeah. and he gets a lot done. So he had like eighteen and twelve against Duncanville. Wow. Uh, so you know th- those were kind of just the hard hitters. It, it, it was good just to see the guys in the school setting. Like you know, yeah. Ron, like when we get to see him in June, you know, we see those kids in a different light. Um, and, uh, because more, you know, in the summer they play a certain way, but yeah. play a completely separate, uh, uh, way. But, uh, I would say the last kid to really, that I would really highlight, uh, who I think is really under the radar, but I think he's a top 10 player in his class in the state in 225. And that's Cameron Paul, uh, about six, 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 seven, mm-hmm. he's a wing, uh, scores the basketball athletic, good body. Uh, really good kid. Like he goes to South Grand Prairie. Uh, got to see him against Sulphur Springs. And Sulphur Springs is always a three, potentially four round uh, deep team in five A. Um, and uh, he just like just gets a lot done. Like he really defended. Uh, he really made shots. A lot of it off the dribble. His 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 motor was better. Uh, that's always my thing with Cam. Is like he has a chance of being a top two to three player in this class, just talent wise. But his motor was so bad, <laughs> you know, the motor and the toughness. So he really came on with it. South Grand Prairie is good for him because they play hard. They get after it. Uh, you see a lot of full court pressing here, uh, but uh, and a lot of yelling. So, like, with him, I think this it was um, it was really good. But overall, I would say, like, Duncanville, Richard Lake Highlands is really good. They beat Lancaster and they beat uh, Louisville High School. Um, and they didn't have Trey Johnson, you know, the uh, Lake Highlands kind of missed. Yeah. You know, they, they, uh, Trey Johnson not being, uh, president, but they got a big kid, Samson Alatan, that was really, that's really good. Uh, he fell a guy like University of Texas offers, got a lot of high major offers since June. Um, mm-hmm. so they lost B. Davis Ray to link your prep, a 225 kid. But I think, you know, just the way they played, you know, it's a lot of promise. Um, so, you know, Dallas, we lost a lot of players. Sure. <laughs> you know, a lot left the city and a lot left the state. Uh, to go to other schools, but I think uh, there's going to be a couple teams that just emerge, like you know Dallas Hillcrest, who's uh, who's in a five A. Uh, they got a lot of really young talent and got some young talent that are high major prospects. Um, Faith Family should be good. Uh, Duncanville, uh, Lancaster's young, but they should be really talented. So I think you'll you'll see some teams like Lucas Lovejoy. I think you'll see some teams that uh, kind of emerge through due to the exodus of players. Got gotcha. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that exactly. If some players leave, somebody's going to step up and fill that void. Um, so two questions I have for you, Ani, is one on the first day of the uh, viewing period. What uh, big name coaches or what player had the most eyeballs in Dallas where a head coach or a whole staff came to go watch him? I would say I would say Dean Pay. <clears throat> I would wow. say Dean Pay. You're getting a, he's getting a lot of. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ding Pei's getting a lot of coaches to come see him. Obviously, Trey Johnson. Uh, yeah. As well, but Trey, he's kind of been uh, hurt. He's not really able just to do what he does. But I would say Trey and Ding Pei. Well, I would say Ding Pei, you know, he, Trey, everyone, he's, you know, ESPN put the number one player in the country, right? Sure. Showing 224. So, like, <clears throat> he is what he is. 
But I think Dean Pate, and I was even talking to some uh, national scouts, they're like, you know, I don't know, there's 25 players in the country better than him. So, sure. you know, you go from like a guy that's like a top 70 guy, and he may be a potential McDonald's All American. Uh, you know, you get a different level of schools now coming to see you. So I would say Dink Payton and Trey Johnson for sure. Ron Holland's list, you know, he is, you know, is he he condenses list. So but I I would say Dink Payton for sure. That makes sense. What happened to what happened to Trey Johnson? What injury does he have? You said he's not able to do. I think what his he's knee. Doing. I think his knee. I think he just I needed some rest. You know, he went from like he just played all summer, then did mm -hmm. uh, Curry camp. Elite 24. I think is I think it's a little bit of me. I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But uh, uh, he didn't play this Saturday. I know he's kind of been just being careful with his uh, with with his just his uh, with his body. I think it's just more that he would just they thought it's the more of a load management. I'd hate to say like okay. a negative way, but it's it's more just making sure he's good. You know, the first games and over here until like November 12th, the like regular season games. So I think sure. it's just time just to rest oh gotcha yeah it makes sense uh, there was some load management here in, in, in the event i went to um but yeah speaking of dink you know it's you funny you talk about movement on and like you said at, at he was at prolific here in california and he would be one just one of you know many many guys right and mm -hmm. he might be their fourth option some games he might be their second option he might be their third best player in another game but like when he's in his regular scholastic high school setting, like he's the man, you know, and like that can change. That can change your outlook and your recruiting many times. So sometimes it works benefit to go to a loaded school. And sometimes it's beneficial to be the man on a team that's maybe not as loaded, you know? So right. I can see that's worked out for Dink pretty well. Uh, for my perspective, the guy that got the most attention or seen and get the most attention was six foot eight, two twenty four Carter Bryant from Sage Hill in Newport beach. Mm -hmm. He's, his father, he plays for his father, who's Deshaun Bryan, who played at Long Beach State. He had Mike, uh, he had all of Duke staff there. So mm. Coach Sire was there, and uh, the Arizona staff was there. I think most of the Arizona staff was there. So it's, I think it's going to come down to those two schools. Again, he, we'll see. Maybe somebody else sneaks up in there, but he's probably going to be choosing between Arizona and Duke. Uh, Carter is a six foot eight, you know, long term prospect, he's terrific. You know, he can block shots. His offense is improving. He can face up. He can score. And he does really well when he's playing. He goes plays against pros, pick up and things like that. He does really well. So he, he'll be on, a, you know, coming along this season. Sage Hill, and he'll have to do a lot because Sage Hill doesn't have a strong team. It's a very small school. And like I mentioned, his father um, is the coach. And his uncle, Trayvon Bryant, was a 2000 McDonald's All-American. He works in the NBA. So, so Carter's well-schooled. And he actually did make the all um, all event team at the Ron Massey turn Memorial turn, uh, Tournament of Champions in the Fall Hoops Classic. There was a, a bracket for the eight best teams, and then there was showcase games for the other teams. And his, his team played in the other game. So some of the top players in that, a lot of good young players, uh, Caden Bailey from Crean Lutheran, 226. Uh, Zaire Beverly, uh, Ani, who you're getting to know a little bit. Yeah. A uh, young player, yeah, hasn't doesn't have much experience. Two twenty three. He was in Florida last year, but he's at Washington High in LA. He's gonna get his recruiting picking up. It is picking up as we speak. Uh, Braden Burry's two twenty five, one of the better two twenty fives in California and in the country. Osami Masiel had a a good game for St. Paul Santa Fe Springs. He's two twenty five guard, about five ten, tough, can hit shots, distributes. Styles Phipps, we know from St. Mary's in Phoenix. Styles had a couple <laughs> monster games, 55 point game oh, and wow. like a 35 point game. Now, Styles is putting it up again. He's one of those kids, when you look at his team, they're not that strong. He has to carry them. He's a D1 player. So he, he's going to, this year, he's going to have to put that team on his back a bit. They don't have much size. And, and, and he was stroking it, he was getting it going. So, so, so kudos to Styles. Um, ben Roseboro, who was also at Prolific before, uh, Ani, he's at Monterey Trail High, which is now a public school in Elk Grove, which is in the Sacramento area. He did good. And um, St. Mary's lost to San Ysidro, which has Mikey Williams. Mikey's back at his high school. He's back in California. Yeah. Uh, Mikey had a really two play two games. He had a triple double in one game. And then he, he didn't score well in the other game. And that's the game uh, Styles had like 35. 
But San Ysidro won. A little bit stronger team. They have a tough team around, Mikey. You know, the Border Boys, a lot of Latino kids that are tough. They rebound, and 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 they have some size. You know, they, they, they got some size on that team. So they have a pretty good team. They're supposed to be the second-best team probably on paper in San Diego. Uh, the best team is St. Augustine. Now, St. Augustine wasn't in the bracket. The bracket included Corona Centennial, who only lost to Duncanville last year. That was their only loss. California State champs, they lost by five points. Uh, they made it to the finals, and they kind of sat their starters. Kind You kind of mentioned how Trey sit, sit out just to, to be mm-hmm. cautious. So uh, Duke bound Jared McCain, UCLA bound Devin Williams, LMU bound Aaron McBride, which are their three uh, returning starters. And they have two other really good players, Eric Freeney, including him, Eric Freeney at 224. They didn't play in the championship game, and that's okay, but we saw what they did. So modern day won the championship. And the team substituted Livery. When when Modern Day realized Centennial wasn't playing their starters, they kind of substituted Livery. So we got to see a lot of the, the bench players. Uh, but the most outstanding player in the event is actually someone whose team lost to Corona Centennial in the first round, Tundi Yusuf. Yusuf. He could really be a really special player. He's he's in the central section at in St. Joseph High in Santa Maria, 225. He now is a wing. He was my state freshman of the year last year. He averaged like video game numbers, like 26 and 14. But he's improved his face of game, his deep shooting. In this event, he had 40 points against Centennial, and it was a high caliber, highly well-played game with good intensity and defense. He had 40 points and seven threes, 33.7 points. Yeah, and he's – Chelsea has big, strong shoulders, big hands. He's way above the rim. He can really go after rebounds. And, like, now he can put it on the deck a little bit and shoot the deep ball. So he's kind of transitioning from a true three, maybe even a four, to, like, more of a three, four. I'm sorry, more Mm -hmm. of a three, three, two. two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he can handle the ball and and shoot it deep. He does need to work like every young player on the drill, amount of dribbles he takes to get into his shot off the pick and roll or making the decision. We've talked about that before. We talked a bit a little about the beginning of the show about how Chelsea Gray is so good at it. But, yeah, um, so he had 14 threes in, in uh, three games, um, 30, 30 points against St. Bernard in his final game. And once he learns to make quicker movements off the ball, you know, and if when he doesn't have the ball and to get into his sh- – movement or get into his decision making when he has the ball he's going to be terrific Mm Ani, i think most people have him in the top 20 but i think he's more like a 10 to 15 guy in that 225 class he's not quite carlos he's not boozer's son he's not the boozer you know he's not that (laughs) level but he's the next step under that you know so he he was terrific he was devoted the most outstanding player i have the all event team and the all uh you know challenge of champions bracket all tournament team on ballslife.com so go go check that out 20 guys made uh there was a lot of showcase games we were there from 9 a.m to 10 p.m last game started at about 10 <laughs> i you know got there at yeah. nine o'clock for the first one bunch of showcase games and then the bracket games were were thrown in between so they played one on saturday and two on sunday um so like i said the the, the whole team is on ballslife.com i won't go over every single name but a lot of the names we did mention uh, the, the thing that we notice is modern day is going to have a lot of, uh, has a lot of good freshmen. Um, che Brogan, who's the son of Tommy Lewis, who was a 1985 McDonald's All American and he played at USC in Pepperdine. Uh, Tom Son is about 6'5, 6'6, uh, 6'5 shooting guard, kind of lefty, kind of moves like, he plays a little like Manu Ginobili, he even has an Euro, uh, international type game, European type game. Very good player. He, they're going to have a good team again. They're always going to be a tough out. Everybody thought that this may be the year that they fall back a little bit with the pack, but if their freshmen do well, they're going to be good. Uh, the other freshman on the team who's very good is uh, Braden Martinson, six foot eight. He's another lefty, really good freshman, good athlete, fluid has good size and, and, and just good passing skills and a good skill level for being an incoming freshman. Again, these are 226. It's crazy to talk about how we're already talking about 226. <laughs> but, yeah, we're already talking about 226. And then the the third freshman uh, on the team is, is, is very good as well. 
So they have three quality freshmen, and it's Luke Barnett, six foot three. He's more of a spot up shooter. He's maybe not be as along as much as Che and Martinson, but he's he's a very good player. So we're coming into the season. Uh, the open division in California in the southern section has been around since 213, 214 that season. And modern day is the only team that has made the open every single year. So mm-hmm. everyone's like, wait, this may be the year where they're on the bubble. They might not win the league title. They might not make the open. But uh, it's going to be a dogfight with, like, St. John Bosco has a bunch of good young players. Jay Sarah has a good team. So the training league is really traditionally one of the strongest leagues in the state. Uh, so they have two long streaks going. They have that streak of being in the open, and this is a crazy streak. They've either won or shared the league title for 35 straight years. This would be their 35th, wow. going for their 35th, yeah, for 34 straight years. So since the last time they didn't win the league <laughs> title was 1987-88. Why I remember that, wow. I, I just, 1987, 1988, they did not win the league title. Bishop of Mott High School won the league title. Um, so... That's a big streak. You know, I mean, they have a lot of pride in the program. You know, they've been nationally ranked many, 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 many times. We obviously know how many great players they've had over the years. Um, even on the girls' side, they have a lot of great players. Kalina Mosquita Lewis. Chelsea, I know mm-hmm. you know who that is. She was my teammate. Yeah. Kalina, you know, they, modern days is well known. So everybody's like, man, this is going to be a tough year for them. But those freshmen are pretty good. So we'll see if they can keep that streak alive. St. John Bosco might win the league. The league champs going to the Open. We just don't know if there's going to be two representatives. In mm-hmm. some years, there's been threes in the eight team open, but the champ will go. So they got their work cut out for them. It's gonna be they're gonna they're gonna earn their keep this year if they get into that open division. How how so, is that how is that twenty six class um, in in, in uh, California? Like in the West Coast, good. Uh, you got him. You got Brandon McCoy, who's a six one guard. He's he's very good. Uh, Ani, the guy who's probably at the top of the list. And again, we'll see what kind of impact he has and. Again, we talk about some guys going to uh, strong teams and other guys going not to strong teams. So Brandon's close to the top of the list. He hasn't chosen what high school he's going to yet. But the guy who's probably the best is Tyran Stokes, and he's going to prolific prep on he's six, 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 seven. He's from the Bay Area. He's um, very good. Uh, so he, I think he's the early leader in the pack. Shea's in that uh, category. Uh, Ty Ingram, who plays for San Ysidro with, with uh, Mikey Williams and the crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ty is Tyrone Shelley's son. Tyrone Shelley played at San Diego State about 12 years ago. He has a 14-year-old son. And, you know, Ty, Ty Ingram's pretty good. Um, he's going to be good. He was at an event I was at since our last pod. Uh, Jason Crow Jr., he had a 45-point game at the Ron Massey. Again, they were in the showcase showcase event. So his first high school game where it's really considered fall ball, like he had a 45-point performance. Mm Six-foot-two guard, lefty. Uh, Ani Jason Crow played uh, professionally for a long time. He's coached in real run. He he coaches at Linwood High School. So he's one of the top. So to answer your question, there's some good names, and it's it's starting off strong. We know 225 is strong at the top with Tundi, Elsie Harrington, Braden Burries. Those two classes are looking good. So it's – I'll, I'll just rattle off how many guys in 226 or 225 made the all tournament team, just so you have an idea of how good they are. Uh, I'm just going to count them out real quick. I'm not going to say their names. We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11. So 11 out of 20, 11 out of 35 were 226 or 225. So strong classes yes. to answer your original question. So the week before I went to Aaron Bergen's full-time dad, he's known on social media, his uh, yes. San Diego event, cream of the County. That was labor day weekend, the weekend before it was a one day mm-hmm. event. And in San Diego, he does a terrific job. You know, we always need somebody whether it's like San Diego or, or the central region in the Valley, Ani, we call it like, the farming country, yeah. Fresno, Modesto, uh, the big Central Valley is huge. You know, it's bigger than most states by itself, but it doesn't have a big metropolitan area. So mm-hmm. we had our guy Paul Hernandez come on the show to talk about the players in that region about five episodes ago. 
And we always need that because we need more information from those regions that are not basically the Bay or L.A., right? Right. So right. Aaron does a terrific job in San Diego, and his Cream of the Crown event is now in its seventh year. Uh, he brings almost all the players from San Diego. Everybody wants to, to participate because they, they want to play in front of scouts that are well-known around the country and things like that, or um, well-known on the West Coast as well. So uh, his event went off really well. Uh, the top player in the event, it was at St. Augustine High School, did come from St. Augustine, um, Lolo Rudolph. Lolo is a terrific guard, 6'2", 224. I mean, he's a blur with the ball. He's great at finding his teammates. Mm -hmm. Nobody can stay in front of him. I like him. Chelsea, you kind of mentioned Kelsey Plum. I like guy guards that just nobody can stay in front of. The downhill. Yeah. yeah, downhill and get in the key and make a play. He's very fast. Uh, he was selected the co-most outstanding player of the top game along with Mikey. Uh, Jerry on Dixon, who's his teammate at San, St. Augustine. They should be the number one team in on paper going into the season in front of San Ysidro. Jerry on is uh, the two last year's player of the year in that uh, section, San Diego section. Big, strong wing, explosive. He did really well. Uh, Angelo Gill, who's Mikey's teammate at San Ysidro High. Two-way combo guard. He did really well. Scored well. Had 17 points in the top game. Uh, you mentioned, or I mentioned Tigram to you, Ani. Yeah. Uh, you know, 226, six foot three. He did really good in the top game. And then a kid who's transferred from Lawndale High, losing your Lawndale. He's now down at San Ysidro. Stephen Evans, Glenn, 6'3", 225. Uh, mm -hmm. Range wing. He's very quick. And I wanted to mention... Um, a kid who I thought did really well, good high school player. I don't know what level he's going to be at. Christian Brown from La Costa Canyon. He plays for the Game Point team. He had really had a good showing, a lot of energy, and he's a good, really good player, and he he deserved mention. So that that was a really good event. Again, it was just one day showcase games in each class, 226, 225, and then the top game included all, all classes. It's very interesting because we talk about how good a player he is or – how good, uh, productive he is. Like, like, I don't know where uh, Christian Brown's going to play in college, but he's a hell of a high school player. And then on the e other end of the spectrum, you have Mikey, and everybody knows who Mikey is. And right, Mikey with his Puma deal, and you know he's he's doing really doing well for himself in life at 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, Mikey didn't play that good statistically in the in the top game. He played, you know, he was. Honestly, like four for 15 going into the final minutes of the game. Mikey just didn't. He was distributing. He just wasn't shooting well. So in typical fashion, like uh, his team is down five points, I believe. Okay. So Mikey hits an and one three, right, with like a minute to go. And then with like three seconds left, he hits the game winning shot in the corner. It was a three. They didn't need a three to win. They only needed a two to take the lead. They were down one. And next thing you know, obviously it's a viral moment. He hit the last two. We're like, who's the MVP? And everybody's like, it ha you know, like Mikey has to be the co-MVP. Like, you know, we're just like, God dang, like it's Mikey. Nobody right. else <laughs> okay, so talk to me about Mikey as a prospect, though. Like, I hear so much more, like, just truthfully. And, you know, I played in San Diego, so I heard about Mikey, you yeah. know, when he was really young. But, sure. like... Talk to me about him as a prospect. I hear more about his NIL and social media yeah. presence than I do about him as a player. Like, what do you yeah. see him doing in college? Where do you see him maybe leaning? And, you know, what's what's his ceiling? Is he an NBA player or what? Um, Mikey's about 6'3", thick, strong kid. He hasn't grown physically and height-wise much in the last two, 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 three years, maybe? Yeah, I'd say three years, yeah. Yeah, about three years. He's, he's been about 6'3" explosive i think he's trying more to be a distributor because you mentioned chelsea wants to play at the highest level he's not a surefire nba player mm -hmm. um he's a good good could be a good cosplayer if he does choose that route again he already has again i i don't know the exact terms of his deal he just turned 18 he's a young man but he's making good money through puma just put it that way he's making good money through puma from what i know a little bit and what his high school coach told me so again what i see for him is like you mentioned in this game, he starts off four for 15 or whatever is the motivation playing against the average high school player. Like he mm -hmm. needs to be locked in playing at his uh, highest potential in his peak at all times. So 
He's a shooting guard. He can play a little bit distribute. He gets by guys. He's strong, physically strong. He attacks the rim. Um, I would say right now he is a top 50 to 60 player. You know, that's that's fair. Some mm-hmm. would say a little higher. Some would probably say a little lower. Lower. Uh, Chelsea, I think he has a, some distract detractors out there, whether it's fans who want to, you know, ride him because, oh, he's not that good, kind of like Mellow Ball a little bit was when he was young, and then mm-hmm. some fans who – Love him because of the highlights. Again, if you weren't at that game, you, you would say, down. oh, Mikey played great, right? He hit the game time three with the and one and then hit the game winning shot and it went viral. But then when you look at the statistics, statistically wasn't playing that great. So to answer your question, I think, again, in, in his financial situation, I'm not sure if he's going to go to college. Uh, I, I would like to see it. But. You know, he's going to either play a professional route and and have a chance. He's going to have a chance. He's going to have the opportunity. Um, but I think he still kind of needs to work on his consistency and just his game and his offensive game, his defensive effort, every possession. And then, um, you know, learning how to play on the ball a little bit, making good decisions, a little, a little because he can pass the ball really well. He just yeah. has to continue to do it and and continue to – lock in every game because all eyeballs are on him every game. So I think uh, that's a fair assessment Uh, on the high end. He'll have a chance because he's athletic on the low end. You know, he won't be an NBA player. Yeah, I I would, uh, I would agree with Ronnie on that. Uh, Again, with his size and athleticism, he handles the ball. Well, and for me, it's just always consistency. Just like Ronnie talked about, like I thought Pangos was the first time I thought I kind of saw some, you know, like, especially with the passing, just the, like, I thought multiple games he actually provided quality play. I think I look at him more as a quality high major guard uh, that could have a chance of playing professionally somewhere. Um, I do think uh, once I would, I just have not seen enough of him consistently bringing it, regardless of who he's going against. And right. that's kind of, I, you would, I would say, like, that's the biggest swing a skill or whatever way you want to say it with me to him. It's like, you, there is some, there is talent. He's a talented mm-hmm. guard. He does get some stuff done. I see more just shot jacking, just kind of, you know, yeah. low, low field goal percentage shooting. Um, I've seen just kind of like a, not as, a, not as much of an intent to really just bring it play by play, which we know, even if you go to the high major level, <laughs> you know, you have to, you have mm-hmm. to, you, you have, have to bring them. Um, <clears throat> so for me, it's like the talent is there. I think he shows moments and flashes, but now as a two twenty three, you know, can he, can he start making that progress and that transition to bringing it more consistently in games? Not just when it's a big game, right? Not just yeah. when it's our big moment. Yeah. yeah, big moment. Can he do that consistently? And uh, I think if he does that, I think he could have a a quality high, uh, college career that mm-hmm. could can brand out and go somewhere professionally somewhere i wouldn't label him as an nba prospect though uh mm-hmm. but yeah. i someone that could play for money at some point mm-hmm. yeah he's sure. making money but like you know <laughs> yeah, talk no, about... I... go ahead chelsea no i said no i i totally understand you know and that's a fair assessment like i said i more see the social media presence than anything else sure. and like you said you know now it's we're in a day and age where everybody's posting highlights and then you see these kids and they're really not like that so You know, you got to kind of have people like you that really can give the real and give a fair assessment and a breakdown of of what these guys are able to do. But I I like that you mentioned that he has a chance because, I mean, you never really know. You know, he could become super consistent and blow up and, you know, maybe he's the next Donovan Mitchell. Who knows? You know, he's undersized, but he's athletic. Like, you just never know. So, um, you know, I just kind of appreciate your guys' perspective and just have him being a kid that I actually know, you know, and you guys – name a lot of kids that I don't know. So I was just very interested um, in, you know, what you guys thought. Yeah, I I see Mikey, and again, I know a little bit about him, and and he's been on the scene so long, it's crazy to think Mm -hmm. he's a senior. But, like, Mikey is got real money. Like, that's what I found out two weeks ago. Like, he's because, you know, he's doing well for himself, and he has a Puma deal that's as uh, comparable to any Puma deal other Puma endorsees Mm -hmm. have. And, and I just for that's a lot for an 18 year old. He's got to, like Ani said, concentrate and 
it's a lot on his plate, you know. He's got to live up to what people say. People are always going to try to detract him and knock him down. And I, I, from what I gather, you know, he's doing a oh, good job. He's very respectful, very likes to talk to me. He knows us because he's we've seen him so many. He's like, hey, guys, what's up? How you doing? It's like a job to him, you know, like, hey, guys, how you doing? You know, how you been? You know, it's like right. everybody because he knows the cameras are on him. Regardless, of, he knows the cameras are on him, you know, and he's got to navigate it himself, a lot of it, you know. So, um, you know, kudos to Mikey. Kudos to Aaron Bergen, who's been a guest on our show for putting on that event. The Ron Massey event was was very good, and and we're transitioning from fall. So the next time we come on the pod, Ani will will be able to talk a little bit about the first Pangos Frost Soft Camp. Yeah, and we'll be able to talk about uh, something that's happening in Vegas. Is our guy Big Vic from from mm-hmm. France is going to be playing in Vegas a couple of games against mm-hmm. Scoot Henderson? On ESPN, Ani, talk, a little, talk huh? a little bit about that. And Chelsea, go ahead. I said on ESPN, right? Because they're these are national yeah. televised games, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I heard about them. Yeah, so I think it's the 5th and the 7th of October. It's coming up fast. So we'll have something to talk about uh, when that happens. We'll be talking about the Fresh Soft Camps. There'll be four of them. The first one's in, in Southern California. And then the next one's in Dallas, Ani, the, which will be right before the Big Vig comes to, to Vegas. So I'll see you then. And then Chicago. And then the one in the East Coast is in the Tri-State, Philly, Jersey area. So there'll be plenty of young players we'll be talking about and some names that will, will, will come up on the on our radar, which is very good. So just talk a little bit about that, Ani, um, this game coming up. Is it is it going to be a lot for him, like kind of predicting what's happening, or is he just going to share with this guy's just a generational prospect? It's a big moment for Scoot, too, and it's a big moment for the G League. I think people are going to want to be interested in watching as Chelsea, as you mentioned, like if you're not – if it's not at 3 in the morning, I don't know if you're going to pull the Serena and wake up and watch it, but you're – you, you know, you, you're going to be interested regardless of what time it's on. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm going I'm to watch it for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that this, uh, it's a big-time game. Uh, you know, Victor came out to Dallas, and he was working out um, uh, with Tim Martin uh, for a certain time. I got to watch a little – I got to watch some of a workout. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's every bit of 7'4". Like, before they said, oh, he's 7'4", I was like, he is not 7'1", or 7'2", <laughs> whatever they're saying. Like, yeah. and I – I'm not a I'm not a guy that can tell you oh he's seven six or seven seven, but yeah. I like he's not what they list him at that point. Uh, really skilled, um, you know. I think he is kind of a generational talent. I think the biggest question is always is he too tall? <laughs> like every time I was just gonna say, yeah. yeah. Do they want to list him at seven two and not seven four? Mm-hmm. Just to list him because he's gonna be facing the basket, shooting threes, and people are gonna be like, whoa, he's seven four, you know. Yeah. Right, like he's like he is really talented. Like he is really, really good. But the the two the two tall things always can he like how long can he play? Can sustain. Can uh, sustain. Yeah, sustain it. But yeah, he's the real deal. I mean, I I I think he's the real deal. Like I I think uh, he yeah. brings a lot to the table. And even though he's skinny, he plays with some toughness about him. Like sure, he, he seems to have um, an edge. And I think we go back where, uh, you know, when uh, France played USA, what, about a year or two ago when Chet was on that team? Yeah. He was the best player on that court. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, he really dominated Chet that game. So, uh, yeah, like, I think he, I think for Scoot, this is a big game as well. You're looking at guys projected right now as one and two. Um, so, uh, but I think we'll get to see a lot of Victor's uh, versatility and just his, just his size and on the offensive end and just how he can able to score inside and out uh, yeah. in, in the defensively, he just, you know, as a rim protector, but mm-hmm. um, like he's every bit of seven, four, like I, getting to watch him like in person, I was like, Whoa, like <laughs> it's a different. Yeah. Can, different level. I have a question on Do you think these games can drop his stock potentially at all? Or is it just like it's written, he's probably going number one, like there's nothing he could do. And also, is there any way that maybe Scoot can possibly, you know, jump him? Because from everything I've read, all these NBA play, NBA teams are ready to tank. Victor's the one. It is what it is. So I'm saying, can you see the board changing at all from these um, maybe two games or uh, what's going to be displayed on ESPN? Yeah, I can see it. Um, Victor would have to play just super soft, super <laughs> unmotivated. Like yeah. even a bad shooting day wouldn't hurt him because sure. more of how does it look? How does he move? How fluid everything does? He, everything how he does things. 
I don't think a bad shooting day would drop him. I would think more of if he comes out there and he just getting punked, <laughs> then mm-hmm. I think that's when those question arise like, hey, can he play? Can you know what is his role? Do we, do we tank for a guy like him? You know, can mm-hmm. he help us win and be the players? That that would be where I would see where he would drop a spot or two. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, even so, and the weird thing, you know, maybe it's like I'm. Um, God forbid, like he gets hurt, you know, then people will start asking about the injuries. That's the, that too tall stuff comes. Oh boy, yeah. You Let's... know, like, like look at Chet. People's like, oh, Chet's hurt because you know he's too skinny. No, I mean, it was kind of a free play. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but Scoot could really help himself. He has a really good, really strong showing. Like, if he just completely is just the best player, and there's no doubt about it. On the other side, yeah. like, he could help his stock. Mm-hmm. But um, I think Victor would just have to play really, really bad and soft. For uh, for him to drop, to be honest with you, mm. that makes sense, and it's tough because it's going to be two games, and you know, on two different dates, and it's we talk about them one two in this next draft, and but the thing is, regardless of what TV does to blow it up, they're not the same position; they're not even close to the same position, right? Like, they're not going to be going head to head. They just have to try to do the best they can for their prospective team and and help win and, and make good basketball plays. So. Yeah, that's gonna be very. It'll be very interesting to see who guards these these two players and how right. well they do. You know what I mean? Like, are good against them. So that's gonna be interesting. So that'll be on our docket. We want to thank everybody who uh, has turned in a Fat Fifty questionnaire for the preseason. That's kind of my focus. That's kind of why we're going every other week right now. So we'll be going every other week leading up to our preseason Fat Fifty show, which should be on November third. So what? Mark your calendars on that date, Thursday. No. November 3rd for all the people who are watching on YouTube or who, who are listening on iTunes or Spotify, wherever else they get their watch the in the paint show. We really appreciate that. So yeah, that, that'll be good. Ani and we'll, we'll, we'll catch up then. Um, Want to thank all, like I said, thank all the people who, who listen and who have responded and it's, it, it's going to be a good, good uh, show. We'll have some guests. Ani put you on the spot a little bit. We'll talk a little bit for a minute as we wrap up and get out of here. Uh, you mentioned Duncanville, the defending national champs. Just putting you on spot, Ron. Where should they start this year? <clears throat> um, because you're defending national champs, I think obviously top three to five. Uh, wow. sort of- but you said they weren't going to be as nearly as good this year. I just think you put them there. Look, I didn't yeah, yeah. put them there because of what they had. Do I? Would I say that will be yeah. the number one team in the country this year? No. Um, mm-hmm. That's fair but- enough. Just because you're the defending champs, you yeah. did they helped yeah. themselves by adding a high major commit in KJ yeah. Lewis, even sure. though they lose the decent <laughs> amount. I think you still put them pretty high. It, I still think you put them pretty high, but are they going to have the season they had last year? No. Yeah, and our guy uh, Eric Demons is that his name? The guard. How's uh, his recruiting going? Uh, he hit the biggest shot of the season, obviously, against Montverde. hit the three at the buzzer. Yeah, Northern Arizona came to see him, I think, on Friday. Uh, he's been okay. Uh, his recruitment is right. a little – you know, it's not where it was after that Montverde game. I mean, you <laughs> had high majors come to see him after that game. But sure. he's probably, he's not a high major player, probably. No, 100, no he's not. No. But yeah. he's a good player. He's a Division one basketball player. Didn't oh, yeah. break summers. Didn't yeah. – uh, was okay Saturday. But, um, you know, his recruitment is just kind of a little bit what it is. I think he's a kid that, you know, maybe someone comes in hard at him and then he signs early. But I, I would I would picture more maybe a, a springtime where yeah. you see him uh, commit somewhere. Yeah. UT San Antonio, I remember he mentioned at that time. Northern Arizona. That seems about his level. So, man, I got to throw him pretty far. So we'll have plenty to debate about on the show. <laughs> then, uh, obviously, we have 50 teams that will make it. Uh, obviously, we know some of them are the staple of the Fat 50 teams every year. And hopefully, we'll we'll have somebody on that previously played high school ball that to give us some perspective of what it means, you know, to be a highly ranked team or a national champ even. So, uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I think for now, me, Chelsea, and I are going to get out of here. Uh, again, we, we appreciate all the, the listening. We're not going to shout out any of the other podcasts right now. We, we They're lagging. <laughs> they're lagging out there. We, we, we're carrying it. So. We, but we appreciate everybody on the pa- Balls Eye Podcast Network. Got to give a shout out to our guy Daniel, who's helped us with the show. He's going to help us with this one coming up. So thank you. Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Peace. Bye, guys. Peace.